Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Uh, tonight, we're continuing the study of the book of Philippians. We will begin chapter 3, verse 1. And before we get started, let's uh, say hello to the congregation. Let's start with the untwisted sister, Renee. Hey there, beloved saints. I'm looking forward to the study tonight. Uh, as I posted on the video earlier, I won't be doing much during the day because it's kind of loud here with the workers, but I have so much to share with you guys. Uh, I'm looking forward to the study tonight. Good, very good. Uh, how about you, Ben? You want to greet the congregation? Hello, everyone. Yes, it's good to be here as well. Uh, I think this is a, a really interesting chapter. Um, and it kind of, you know, we're kind of getting to the point where he's, we're kind of, uh, He's bearing the fruit of what he, the groundwork he laid in the previous two chapters. So I think this is a really interesting chapter, and, and I'm looking forward to the study. Yeah, and uh, I, I apologize that we're we're starting a little bit late, but uh, we we got a little carried away because we're very uh, excited about uh, some. Uh, we're rethinking and restudying our um, uh, eschatology, our end times stuff. So it, it's it's. It's very exciting for us, but uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing all that with you in the near future. Um, all right. Uh, if there's nothing else uh, we need to say, um, any prayer needs, though, I, anything pressing that we need to pray for anybody's needs, Renee? Ben? Not that okay. I'm aware of, no. Uh, I'm no, sure I, something. I'll have stuff on Sunday. But I do want to praise report. Anthony was delivered from his anxiety meds. I know that's very scary for a lot of people. Uh, a few years ago, uh, it's been a little more than a few years. Uh, I determined that there, there, there was just too much medication, and I really relied on those. I had a lot of trauma, and so I knew that it would be hard for me because physically I might have some withdrawal because it's a benzodiazepine. You know, it helps calm you down, and uh, but I felt. That it was right. It was the right time for me to get off. I've never taken them since. Um, but I do not suggest anybody do that. Uh, you need to be with a doctor to slowly take yourself off of these because it is dangerous. I'm not giving medical advice on that. You always deal with your doctor. But I'm happy to hear that, Anthony, because a lot of people want to be off, and it's very, very difficult. Um, so I know that God will give you the right timing. If you uh, determine you 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 can do without a medication, eventually something like that, you can eventually get off if the Lord wills. And if not, his grace is sufficient for us. So don't feel bad about taking meds, but I know you want it to be off of them. So I'm happy that you're delivered from that. Mm -hmm. I have to be careful. That is, that is good news. We celebrate that. That. Yeah, we have to be careful that people don't think we're condemning or promoting one way or the other. Medi flesh is flesh. People take medicine for all kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with it. But if somebody wants to be off of it and they are able, that's very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ben, uh, will you start off by reading uh, verse one uh, uh, for Sister Renee? Okay. Verse one in the KJV, uh, Philippians chapter three, verse one, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Hmm. Hmm. All right, Sister Renee, can you explain it? Yeah, I want to go back because whenever a chapter starts with therefore or finally, he's continually a thought from the chapter prior. So, you know, we, we can't forget that just because a chapter is split or start somewhere that it's a new thought. It isn't. It might just be a break in the continuation. So in this case, saying finally, my brethren, is just a break in his thought. And he's continuing what he was saying from earlier. Um, and so what he said earlier in the chapter prior is that uh, Timothy would be sent to them uh, to visit shortly and that he was very, very happy about that and that his heart was truly for them um and so he's telling him about his visit and so his final uh, bit of instruction regarding that is finally my brethren rejoice in the lord to write the same things to you to me 
indeed is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Um, so I, I'm not sure what it, what it means by to write the same things to you is not grievous, uh, but for you, it is safe. I don't know why that message would be grievous that I guess because he's not coming. I don't know. I have to look at the context more. I just now opened up from last week. Um, so, I mean, it's clear what rejoice in the Lord means. Uh, I guess, I guess he's just, I'm not sure what dangers could he be talking about? Uh, without going to the prior chapter a little further back, so. Well, let's, can, let's see. Let's see. Maybe Ben has some insight on it, and I'll look at uh, the amplified and the see if there's any footnotes. Go, go ahead, Ben. Okay. Well, uh, Brene, I think Brene uh, uh, identified a key a key uh, aspect in interpretation. Um, you know, he starts off with the word "finally," so I think he's summarizing basically what he essentially said uh, in chapter one and two. And when he, so the New King James, by the way, instead of grievous, it says tedious. And I think that's probably uh, more, I think that's probably more in line with our modern day understanding of the word. Um, and so again, he's saying, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write these same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So, you know, there's nothing wrong about him writing the same things and, re, and even uh, repeating the, the same things over and over again. In fact, I'm always... Uh, I, one of the uh, traits that I have, or one of the, uh, one of the one one trait that I admire both in you and Renee, is your ability to repeat the same things and yet have the same passion and zeal for it. Uh, for me, it's like okay, I already said this, you know, and I just I don't know, and and, and it's good because I don't pick up everything people say either. So uh, like there's there's times where I'll say the same thing over and over again, and then someone will say, oh wow, I never noticed that. And I said, I, I say to myself, well, I said that a couple, you know, several months ago, or, and I'm sure the same, same, same thing happens with you guys too. You'll say something and, um, and I know for a fact that I'll, you'll, you'll said something many times and I'll say, oh, now I get it. It just really clicks. So I think it's important that we, we do, uh, that's why we have the scriptures they're, they're written down for a reason. So we can go back to them and remind ourselves of these things, uh, being reminded of, of simple truths. Are it, you see that all throughout Scripture? Second uh, Peter is about reminding uh, what they already knew. Hebrews is, is about reminding them about what they already knew and not to become dull of hearing. So there's nothing wrong about with that at all. And with regards to it being tedious, you know, again, it, I, I I do consider it tedious when I had to repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, because again, when the first time I say, I, I, that's what I have with my passion and energy. And then the second, subsequent times, like, oh, well, that's kind of old. That's old news to me now. Um, but I think it's uh, something that uh, I need to, you know, work on. And with regard to it being safe, um, I think he's basically saying, again, uh, especially in, with if in re, in the context of the next verse and what he had previously warned about, um, about you know people being. Uh, it, it's all, the previous chapters were essentially about the furtherance of the gospel and fellowship in the gospel and to be aware of people who will have their own selfish ambition are not serving the Lord or the gospel, but they're really serving themselves. And I think for him to keep on repeating and reminding the, these, this church to be selfless, do not lose focus of, of the, of the prize of the main goal, which is to get the gospel out. That's the, that's the overall goal. Um, so in that sense, it's safe to them to remind them so they don't fall into false teaching or false, uh, uh, you know, follow a, a bad example of what a, a, a Christian should be like. Uh, you know, he says, follow my example. Um, so I think that's that's the gist of that verse. Um, you know, again, the, the previous chapters have really been about selflessly serving Christ and the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel and fellow believers. That's the priority. And... Um, that brought great joy, even though it seemed counter to be joyful, because again, he Paul rejoiced uh, that uh, he you know he knew that even though he was in chains, that his it was all in God's plan. It, it was all God's plan for furthering the gospel, and he rejoiced even though he was in prison. He rejoiced um, that even though he he thought that perhaps his death might be impending. That was in. Uh, previous chapter in, in verses 17 through 18 he says yes 
And if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So uh, I think that, I think that's essentially what he means by safe and, and grievous. Yeah, I, I think you did a real good job there, Ben. Uh, you emphasized the right things. As, I, as I'm looking at these other translations, it might be helpful here. Uh, in the Amplified, it says, Finally, my fellow believers continue to rejoice and delight in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. So uh, and I look, when I look at the NABRE, it also uses the word safeguard. So when we, if we think of it in terms of safeguard rather than safe, I think it does uh, fit together with the idea that, hey, I keep repeating myself and, and, and as a safeguard to drive this point home to make sure you don't ever deviate from that. I'm repeating it as a safeguard to keep you on track. Uh, uh, and then uh, in the uh, Young's Literal, it translates it this way. The same things to write to you to me indeed is not tiresome and for you is sure um so rather than safe um so i i do think that uh, that really is a, a a sensible conclusion that it's not talking about being safe from oh let's say evil doers or attacks or martyrdom or anything like that it's just it's a safeguard to make sure that they their doctrine doesn't get uh, uh you know uh, they don't go into error uh there's a footnote here uh uh, on the NABRE, it says in verse about verse one, it says, finally, and rejoice. That is, the, the adverb often signals the close of a letter, uh, while the verb could also be translated goodbye or farewell. Although it never, uh, although it is never so used in Greek, epist, epist, epistolog, epistol, epistolography, whoosh, that's a tough one to pronounce. The theme of joy has been frequent in the letter. Uh, note also in Philippians 4.4 4, uh, and the addition of always, there is evidence for the meaning rejoice. Uh, to write the same things may refer to what Paul has previously taught in Philippi or what he has just written or what follows. Um, so that that uh, footnote didn't didn't talk about the word safe, but I, I think that uh, Ben, you hit on it, and I think that uh, that's really the way. You, Renee, what do you think now? Yeah, I, I agree. It makes more sense. Uh, so funny, Kevin says I've never heard Renee say I'm not sure. Well, I wasn't sure, <laughs> so I've, I'm not sure because I I don't really don't remember what was in the prior chapter for him to be wrapping up. And so what would be safe? That's the word that threw me. Why would it be safe? So the way Ben explained that, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's not grievous as well. So it's it's not tedious. I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but he's saying it's it's necessary. It's a, it's safe for you to keep hearing it. It's good for you to keep hearing it. I, I think he said that well. So yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, and, and uh, the idea that uh, Renee uh, said that uh, she was unsure of uh, something is uh, that really shouldn't surprise anybody. Be, I mean, I know we don't hear it very often because normally she she has an answer. Um, but uh, let let it be a lesson to everybody. Uh, no, no matter who we are, we need to admit sometimes uh, that uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Maybe I need help with this one. Uh, I'm not so confident in, in my understanding. I mean, who, who understands every verse in the Bible? I, I made a video a couple of years ago. I said, um, uh, looking for a new teacher. And people, oh, what's wrong? Are you, are you replacing somebody on the panel or something? And I, I, I said, no, the point, and the point I was making is I'm looking for a teacher who can, who can uh, is qualified to say, uh, I understand every verse in the Bible perfectly. Uh, if, if anybody is uh, able to claim that, let me know. I want you to teach me. But uh, is there anybody who really can make that claim? I, I haven't found them. Okay, uh, shall we go to the next verse? If so, uh, Renee, why don't you read uh, verse 2 and, and let, let Ben uh, comment. 
But if um, you read two and three together, I think. I think they would go together, don't they? All right. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. For we are the circumcision, which work, worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, well, this is one of the many reversals you see in Scripture. Uh, you know, for example, that the Jews thought that they were righteous and the uh, Gentiles were unrighteous. Yet we, we're going to find that the uh, G the Gentiles will be righteous by faith and the Jews, many of them unbelieving, will be found to be unrighteous. Again, they thought they, they thought they're righteous by the flesh. And again, it, uh, all through the Old Testament uh, and even in New Testament, uh, the Gentiles is referred to as dogs. Like Jesus, for example, in Matthew 7. Six says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and tear you into pieces. And then also, too, there's that uh, in Matthew 15 with the, um, with the, uh, there was a Gentile who cried out to Jesus, who said her daughter was demon-possessed. And uh, Jesus said to her, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And then she said, yes, Lord, even yet. Yet, even the little dogs eat crumbs which fall from the master's table. And uh, he replied to her by saying, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Again, her faith is what made her no longer a dog, essentially, because she was, she was, uh, she could be declared righteous if you believe in him. And all through Revelation, too, he says, you know, we, we read, Outside are the dogs and those who love and practice lies. Those are people who are unsaved. And so it's really a stark uh, reversal or stark contrast that uh, uh, Paul is making here. Uh, it's really a polemic. Uh, again, a polemic is, uh, I don't know how you would define it, but it's basically a, a kind of a slap in the face or a refutation of uh, false uh, deity or false um, false beliefs. Um, and again, he, so you see that reversal here. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Well, with the mutilation we know is uh oh actually actually verse three also says for we are the we are of the circumcision who worship god in the spirit rejoice in christ jesus who have no confidence in the flesh so again the the, the mutilation those who uh mutilated or circumcised their flesh thinking that somehow makes them righteous um which is again it, it just a uh a kind of a polemic against uh self-righteous uh legalism uh, particularly the Jewish uh, who reject Jews who rejected Christ, who act, actually they themselves now trampled the the Son of God, the blood of the of his they trampled his blood under their feet. Um, as you know, so um, you know we don't have any confidence in the flesh at all. We he says beware of them because he knows that Judaizers are, always will come in, and even if it they, even if it doesn't come from without, it can always come from within. There's a lot of believers. That can easily slip into legalism, and and that's why we need to be aware of it. Um, but particularly Judaizers, and I think now of of, of uh, you know he, Hebrew rooters who claim Christ, but they say he's not enough. They you know you got to keep all these laws, and uh, you know you, you you should observe uh, you know the types of shadows that are, are in the Old Testament that point to Christ, um, and somehow that that's going to keep you righteous um, or make you righteous. That again, faith alone is not enough. Those are dogs, evil workers, mutilation, if they never uh, repent of that false belief. Um, and again, you see here, evil workers. Uh, that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, by the way, uh, it says, workers of iniquity. Um, uh, because the law, even, even if you, they may appear to be good works. Again, in Matthew 7, where I just read that verse, with, with uh, verse 6, where it said, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before a swine, lest they trample them under the feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That's exactly what the law does. It makes you like an, an animal. Uh, your, your flesh is governed by sin. It's sin-possessed. And the power of sin is that law. And the law will make you tear and devour you into pieces. Uh, you know, when, when Israel, when in Canaan, before they entered the land, there were... Uh, they took, gave a false report that the, they, they, that the land, uh, again, it's, I think it's a picture of the future Jewish nation under the law. It said the land devours its inhabitants. It, again, because uh, it's a picture of what the law does. It devours you. And that's why Paul says, uh, you know, if you, 
if you continue to judge each other by the law, you, you, you're going to bite and devour each other. It's 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 the beast nature. The, the law is for, <laughs> essentially governs our sin or our beast nature, our animalistic side. Um, I can say so much more, but again, that's why we need to be born again in the spirit, and that's why he says we, for we are the circumcision who who worship God in the spirit. So we don't have any confidence in our flesh. We've been circumcised from our flesh. Our old identity in Adam has been cleaved or circumcised from us and done away with forever. That's why Paul says, you know, flesh profits nothing. Only thing that matters is the new creation. We need to be born again in the spirit. And uh, that's those are, are those who truly worship God. You can't worship God in the flesh. All right, great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, this is Sister Renee. What do you have to say? Uh, yeah, and he's absolutely right. The, the phrasing here is great. Because it's, let me read it through and you'll see what I mean. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And concision means the cut up ones, the circumcised. Okay. And the reason, like the word concise, make it short, cut it off. Um, beware of the circumcision. For we are the circumcision. That's what Paul's saying. Beware of the circumcision because we are the circumcision. And so he's saying that because they're legalists. They're going to come in and tell you, you need to be cut in the flesh. But we are the true circumcision, circumcised of the heart. So that's the warning here. But beware of dogs. He's absolutely right. A dog is someone who lives outside the house. So a dog is someone that's outside the house of God. That's why he called the woman Ben's talking about a dog. She's a pagan. So they yeah. were outside the house of God, outside of God's people. Uh, beware of evil workers. That's just a general warning. Beware of the concision. That's the circumcised, the Jews, the legalist. So beware of the circumcision or concision, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And you can replace circumcision with any work done. But Circumcision is so perfect because it's an actual mark in the actual flesh. But that can work for anything you put trust in. Your ability to be righteous in your flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh. I've heard legalists try to say, see, this is only talking about we don't put any confidence in the marks of our flesh like the circumcision do. But you still have to keep the ten They completely miss the whole overall point of this is that it, you're trusting law or you're trusting Christ. You you cannot trust both. If a be of grace no longer works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And Christ is of no effect to you. And so uh, it, it's good that you had this put together, Luke, when we read them. So we'll read it together now. Beware of dogs, those outside the house of God. Beware of pagans. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision, the circumcision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, who have no confidence in the flesh. So the legalist would come in still adhering to the temple system. So they're worshiping God in the temple system and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in him. We don't offer the animals and have no confidence in the flesh. We don't do a mark in our flesh. We have the Holy Spirit. That's what distinguishes us from people that are not God's people. So it is like a this, not that thing. Play on words here. Beware of the circumcision for but because we are the real circumcision. They're not. They're going to come in claiming that they are the true people of God because of a mark in their flesh. But we are really God's people. It has nothing to do with the flesh at all. Okay, thank you. I have to confess, though, when you started off there uh, talking about um, concise and shortened and cut off, I mean, you really started to scare me there a little bit. <laughs> well, Paul does make a snide comment like that, doesn't he? Uh, I would if they were cut off from you. Yeah, it was it was pretty scary. I don't I don't know if I can handle much of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me let me read two and three in the Amplified and see how they phrase it. Um, look out for the dogs, that is the Judaizers, the legalists. Look out for the troublemakers, 
look out for the false circumcision, that is, those who claim circumcision is necessary for salvation. For we who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, set apart for his purpose, and are the true circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and glory and take pride and exult in Christ Jesus and place no confidence in what we have or who we are in the flesh. Though I myself might have some grounds for confidence in the flesh, uh, if I were pursuing salvation by works, uh, if anyone else thinks that he has reason to be confident in the flesh, that is, in his own efforts to achieve salvation, I have far more circum. Oh, wow. Did I go too far? I went. Through, I read through four. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, got, I got a little carried away there, but it was so interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, that uh, uh, they did a good job amplifying it. Uh, you know, uh, there are people that have uh, criticized uh, me for um, uh, using uh, the amplified, uh, oh, for that matter, anything apart from KJV, but particularly. You will, not burst, into flames. You will not burst into flames if you pick up a, a different version. You will yeah. not explode or anything like that. Just want to dispel those rumors. The panic yeah. feel. They Thanks. panic and pick up another version, Luke. <laughs> But uh, uh, the Amplified uh, and any other translations, um, when we read them, we're hoping that maybe we'll gain something by it. But we're also going to be on guard because we're looking to see if there is any false uh, interpretation there. Because some of the modern translations, they, they tend to insert things uh, that uh, change the gospel to uh, uh, works. So um, when we discover that, when we do find a problem, though, it's not really a problem because we're, we're actually exposing the, the modern translation for, whoops, look what they did with that one. So we, we condemn them for that. But we're on the other hand, doesn't mean that we cannot, in other places, find that it's helpful. Uh, and in this case, they, I think they did a very good job amplifying or, or expounding uh, on those two, two verses. Uh, there is a footnote here in the NABRE, uh, but this footnote is broad. It, it's, it's, it says it's from verse 2 to verse 21. So this footnote will give us an overview uh, uh, as we're going forward here. It says, an abrupt change in content and tone, either because Paul at this point responds to disturbing news he has just heard about a threat to the faith of the Philippians uh, in the form of false teachers, or because part of another Pauline letter was inserted here. See introduction. Uh, the chapter describes these teachers in strong terms as dogs. The persons meant are evidently different from the rival preachers in Philippians 1, 14 through 18, uh, and the opponents in Philippians 1, 28. Since Philippians 3, 2 through 4 emphasize Jewish terms like circumcision, some relate them to the Judaizers of the letter to the Galatians. Uh, other phrases make them appear more like the false teachers in 2 Corinthians, uh, the, the evil workers. The, the latter part of the chapter depicts the many who are enemies of Christ's cross in terms of that they may sound more Gentile or even Gnostic than Jewish. Accordingly, some see two groups of false teachers, in Philippians chapter 3. Others, one group characterized by a claim of having attained perfect maturity. So that's a, a kind of a broad overview of uh, the remainder of the, the, this chapter here. Uh, all right, do you want to add any more, Renee? Or yeah, ben, I do actually. Up? I just looked up something. <clears throat> I found it was interesting. Because the word evil worker in general, I wanted to see if there's anything else, and I looked up that same commentary I found last week. And well, one of the reason he, he used concision instead of circumcision is because it's derogatory because it, it gives more of a, uh, um, like a negative connotation to circumcision because it means to mutilate, to cut up. So it's instead of elevating them to the circumcision as the set apart, holy people of God, it's the cut up people. 
because that's what it means to Paul now, because it, it means nothing. Circumcision means nothing in the new covenant. It's just, that's, it's meaningless, if, especially if you're putting trust in it, right? So, and then the other thing is an interesting idea. I had, I hadn't thought of it this way, but evil workers is a common term used throughout scripture in general. And that's what I accepted it to be. But here, the guy seems to be thinking, as the first, as you were saying, Luke, it could be referring to one group of legalists over and over again. Those that preach working for salvation, so they'd be beware the evil workers, because they're they're trying to work for their salvation. So beware the dogs, the evil workers, the circumcision or the concision. Uh, so it seems that he's probably condemning the legalistic teachers coming up behind him uh undoing all the work he's done to preach grace and uh uh faith alone in christ so it, it seems that i i think i agree with the um uh what you were saying luke it could be many different kinds of false teachers or just one type i i tend to think it is basically one type those that are teaching works for salvation I think that's exactly it. I mean, if, if you look at this, it says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Well, we know the mutilation is, is uh, Judaizers, essentially. And there's a, a pretty strong parallel, to again, to Matthew 7, where it says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. And then, he, then that's in Matthew 7. And then he launches right into, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. A wolf is a dog. And at the end of that whole... Uh, diatribe but he says and then i will declare to them i never knew to you depart from me you who practice lawlessness or workers of iniquity again it's, i think it's just a way of saying no you can't be justified by works so any works you do that's why i i i, I uh resist the idea that um you know people are uh that you that people try to uh 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 uh, 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 separate works and sin. In the Bible, they're intri int to me, they're intricately worked. Sin, oh. your worker iniquity or sin. So again, uh, so there's some people for, say, for example, oh, well, people go to die, go to hell for their sins. They go to hell because they, their works weren't good enough. I disagree with that for the, for the reason of, again, you, it, they're, they're coupled together. They're not separate. You yeah. can't separate yeah. them. Um, I hear you. So I think uh, that's what he's kind of evil workers in that in this respect he's just basically saying oh well these people are teaching you have to be righteous workers and he's just rebuking it roundly and saying oh no you actually those worker those works are actually filthy rags and uh, even though they look good just like these false prophets in Matthew seven beware they look these false prophets they look good they look like sheep because they, they their outward appearance they do good works. But what's the the fruit in that context is their confession of faith, and what they'll be found is that they'll be uh, justified by wor their words and condemned by their words because their words will show that they uh, rejected Christ, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit essentially. So yeah, uh, I think that's a kind of a consistent theme. Because sin and offering works is sinful. Offering works is sin. So that I, I agree with you, Ben. That there is no, uh, like, I hate it when people say that, see, they're workers are iniquity. They were lawless. You practice lawlessness. So you you were in habitual sin. Like, we're, you, you're you you're either completely perfect or you're, you're a total sinner. There's no, like, you practice it more than another, and that's why you're condemned. It's ridiculous. You know, they, they everything they do is iniquity. And in, in Genesis, it's clear with Cain, Cain bringing... Cain, now I, I've seen extra biblical uh, uh, stories about Genesis and the rabbis put that Cain brought uh, the lesser of his, his, his fruits and field work, you know, like the bread offerings and fruits and vegetables or whatever he brought to it. It was inferior quality and kept the best for himself. I don't think that was it. I think he literally offered works and no blood. And God will not accept anything but the blood. And so that, see, in the Jewish mind, that that would make sense to them. Well, he didn't offer good enough works. He did. He kept his best, you know, works to himself. And but I think Cain and Abel is clear that the works are iniquity. To offer works for salvation and think you're going to be right with God for it 
is sin. It is iniquity. And uh, it we see it all through scripture. I think there's an Old Testament verse that's in, and the man who trusts in his own righteousness. You know what verse I'm talking about? It's an Old Testament verse about trusting in their own righteousness. None of their righteousness shall be remembered or yeah, something. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people love that verse. It says, you know, the soul who sins shall die. Uh, and they, and they, they say that, that, you know, uh, he, uh, if a, a righteous man departs from his righteousness, yeah. none of his righteous works will be remembered. Yeah. And then it, it, vice it versa. Mm -hmm. You can lose but, your salvation. That's what they love to right. hear. And that's all about uh, the law. <laughs> and uh, also, too, again, when, when you said um, about Cain, yeah, you know, when, when Cain offered his works, uh of the ground again his works of the ground were basically works of the flesh were earthly you know earthly works not yep. spiritual uh again these themes are co consistent through scripture so i think a lot of times people just try to interpret a verse as it as if it exists in a vacuum when i believe <laughs> the bible yeah. is consistent all the way from revelation to genesis and when it says like uh when cain's uh countenance was downcast he said if you why 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 are you downcast if you do if not if you don't do if you do what is right will you not be accepted and i think that's a direct parallel also too which i get another verse that's misinterpreted and used by lord shippers and john where it says there's a day coming that those who, who have done evil will be resurrected to everlasting contempt paraphrasing and those who have done right to everlasting life well again the done right there is they did they they followed god's plan of salvation not their own they they did what God told them to do, which is to believe on the Son. Um, and again, I think that's a picture of Cain and Abel. You know, uh, Abel did what was right. He did what God prescribed to be, for a right relationship with him. Where Cain uh, forsook the the right way. You know, he wanted to go on his own. He wanted to do it on his own terms. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, ben, would you read uh, four, five, and six for Renee? Sure. Okay. Verse four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh for any other man. I'm oh, sorry. Let me read over again. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in, in the flesh, I more circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Yeah, it, it's crazy to me how we see this repeated in scripture where false teachers come in behind Paul, tell the congregation, Paul's a false apostle. We see that in the other uh, uh, book where it says, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me and so basically says you want to examine me, examine yourself. Don't you know the spirit of Christ is in you? If he's in you, then I'm a, I must be a real apostle. But he goes on another place and says, join me in my folly. I've got to boast a little bit because he sees how ridiculous and pointless it is to boast. However, these false teachers are coming in boasting of their credentials as legalists. I'm a Pharisee. I studied under so-and-so. He studied under Gamaliel, who's the greatest known rabbi of the time uh, uh, regarding the law. Pharisees are what we would consider doctors of theology, doctors of the law. So uh, Paul here is saying, OK, these false teachers are coming in saying I'm false because I'm telling you that the law can't save, that there was all a shadow of Jesus. They're coming in claiming to have all this knowledge and they should know because they got this qualification in the law, et cetera. And what he's saying is I've got the same mark in the flesh they got. I grew up under uh, a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee myself. I got all the, I got them all beat, basically. If they want to boast in what they know and and being a Hebrew and circumcision, I, I can boast more than they can. But I'm not teaching the law. I'm teaching the gospel. The law cannot save you. So his thing here is, pointing out his qualifications only in the sense that false teachers are trying to boast in their qualifications. And he's saying my qualifications in that area beats them also. And I'm telling you that over there can't save their false. Let's stick to focusing on Jesus. So he, the only reason he's even boasting about any of this 
is because the false teachers try to say he's a false teacher by boasting in their own legalistic works. Mm -hmm. Jewishness. Mm -hmm. Their Jewishness. Mm -hmm. You know, they would boast. We knew God first. We're the ones that had the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. All right, Ben. Four, five, and six. What, what do you say? Exactly what Renee said. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he was, uh, you know, he followed the law as best as anyone probably ever did on, on the earth. <laughs> And except for Christ, of course, uh, and he fell short. He couldn't do it. He couldn't keep the law. But and he says he's blameless. Doesn't mean he, he he was righteous by the law. He just meant that. I think it essentially means that, you know, he he did what was prescribed by the law. Uh, it doesn't mean he was sinless. It just means he did what was prescribed by the law. He continued in it. He advanced in it. He advanced in it. Probably like I said, like he said, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He uh, advanced in it. He continued in it. So in that respect, he was blameless. Um, but again, he, 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 uh, he didn't have any confidence in the flesh at all. Um, in fact, I, I, so I, I think I'll leave it for, at that for now, because the next verse is kind of capture what I wanted to get into. So, um, Renee did a, did a great job. All right. Thank you. Okay, I've got some thoughts, but before I go, let me read it in the Amplified and see if I learn anything. Uh, four, five, and six in the Amplified says, Though I myself might have some grounds for confidence in the flesh uh, if I were pursuing salvation by works, if anyone else thinks that he has reason to be confident in the flesh, uh, that is, in his own efforts to achieve salvation, I have far more circumcised when I was eight days old of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, an exemplary Hebrew, as, as to uh, the observance of the law, a Pharisee, as to my zeal for Jewish tradition, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness, uh, supposed uh, right living, which my fellow Jews believe is in the law, I prove myself blameless. Um, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, uh, your, your opinion on um, whether Paul should have said that or, or not. Uh, I, there, there was a co-worker we had at CES for a long time, uh, and uh, this person... Uh, would routinely uh, get in debates with lordship uh, heretics. And I, I heard him often, uh, so many times, it was just part of his normal routine that uh, to try to illustrate that, uh, look, the lordship heretic thinks that they're uh, going to be saved by their works, but, uh, well, and, and, and they accuse us of, of not having any works or not believing in works for salvation. Well, uh, he would say, uh, well, I, I don't believe works are needed for salvation, but if you want to compare works, I'll compare works with you. And, and uh, goes on to a, a diatribe about uh, all the works that he does and that he does far more works than the other individual who is trusting in their works. I've always cringed whenever I, I heard him uh, uh, take that approach. Uh, I, I think it would have been perfectly fine uh, and, and, and good uh, strategy to, to say that we do not trust in our works at all, but that doesn't mean that we are not working. We, 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 we do keep busy in our ministry works, but to go on to the length that he did uh, and you know, I used to call it a, um, what is it called when you have a contest comparing things with uh, with somebody else? And it's uh, really, a, um, it, it's really, what's, um, right? it just, it looks, it makes everybody look bad. Uh, it, we don't want to get into that kind of a contest where comparing our works to other people, like I got more works than you. That, that's, that's the wrong road for us to go down, I think. Uh, but that's what Paul does here. And so I'm wondering, as you know, Paul has admitted that 
uh, uh, that, uh, oh, he uh, does the wrong things when he's, he wants to do the right thing, but he does the wrong thing. And, uh, but it's not him, it's the sin that's in his flesh. So, uh, and, and he, had, he, he admits numerous times in the letters as we've been going through these studies that uh, maybe this is me, this is not from the Lord, this was just me speaking. And I'm wondering if this portion here, uh, even though Paul, if you're going to actually compare, Paul could certainly boast more than, that he did more than anybody, any of these others. Uh, and yet, it really, do you think it was a mistake for him him to do that? That that he he really, I understand why uh, he's defending himself and trying to show that uh, uh, if, if you think works are important, well, let's compare works. I've done more than you and I know that they're worthless. They don't, they're no value at all for my salvation. But what do you what do you think? Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Like as I do, or am I uh, being too critical of Paul? Well, I think all scriptures God breathed, so God. It's not like uh, I don't think we. <laughs> I, every word I, I think is there for our instruction. Um, well, and, don't forget, Paul. Paul even said said that. Uh, and, um, I remember in, I think it was in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, where he's saying, this portion is not from right. the Lord. These are my words here. So that's in the scriptures. Yes, you're and, right. Yep. You know, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's uh, uh, correct. It, it's the best approach. It's the right way to, to, to answer somebody. Oh, well, I, I think that he had to, Luke, because there were, I think the, there were large amounts of the congregation going after these people. And I, I think that they were following, starting to follow these people based on their so-called qualifications. And so Paul had to lay down the qualifications to defeat theirs uh, in order to put that to rest. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, uh, I see that Hendricks is trying to get my attention. He, he, he says, uh, Brother Luke, for Paul's case, remember, He's making mention of his time under the law to highlight the fact he isn't following the law anymore and left it for Christ. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I mean, I, it's, it's not that it, there, it doesn't serve a purpose. It can certainly shows that, look, if you're going to trust your works, it, compare your works to mine. I've done far more than you have. Your, your works are pale in comparison to mine, and yet I'm not trusting in my works. I know that, that that's not the means of salvation. Right. So, uh, I mean, he could use that to drive that point home. It's uh, it's just that, uh, I, I don't know. I I do I think that there's something, uh, there's something that Sister Renee said. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sister Lisa said, go ahead, Renee. I'm going to look for something real quick. I, I, was, I was saying, I think that's, uh, that's not really what Paul's doing. I think He's qualifying more than saying my works are better. I think he's qualifying as a teacher, as someone qualified. You see, it it's not uh, because because the only reason these false teachers were gaining any headway and come coming up behind Paul was their qualifications. Right, and so he's saying. You, you're following after them because of their qualifications. Well, I don't boast of mine, but here they are. Like I, I could, you know, you don't follow these people just because they claim to know the law and all that. It doesn't matter how much knowledge of the law you have. If you want those qualifications, here they are. But that's not the, what qualifies me to speak on behalf of Christ. That's, that's the message they're bringing you is not the message I'm bringing you. But if, if the only reason you're following these people is they're, legal qualifiers then here you go i know more than the people claiming to come behind me do in that area also so i think that was the only way to put it to rest because i really do think it came from well i'm a jew i grew up a jew i know the scriptures you you don't paul is telling you not to keep them but i'm telling you look what god said you know and i think he basically has to come to these gentiles and say yeah i'm a jew too i grew up a pharisee which is you know greater than just a, a religious Jew. So um, I think he's, this is more of a saying uh, a qualifier for him in the eyes of these people that were elevating these legalists 
uh, based on their scripture knowledge or being a Jew or whatever, a covenant people. And so Paul had to stamp that out. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's, I, I was trying to find something. Apparently I didn't save it, but Sister Renee, I'm not Sister Renee, no, uh, Sister Lisa, uh, I think it was probably on a Friday night program. She said something and I thought that, oh, wow, well, this is, uh, I want to save that because the way she stated it was so perfect. Uh, I'll, I'll try to express it, but uh, everything in the Bible uh, is like was is truly happened, but not everything in the Bible is truth. Uh, I, I'm not really saying exactly right, but uh, the point I think is still the same, is that we have things in the Bible, okay, uh, I'm not challenging that uh, that's not a real person, they didn't really say that, that wasn't really taught, but it doesn't mean that it's truth. Look, look at the the, what the Pharisees taught, what the Sadducees taught, what uh, 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 the, 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 the Judaizers, all, all these things. There's a lot of false teaching in the Bible. Uh, does that mean that it's not scripture? It doesn't belong there? No, it's, it's there for a purpose, but it's not there for us to follow. Okay. Uh, let me see. Did I, uh, yeah, I read that, so see if there's a footnote on four, five, and six. Uh, no, there's not. No, there is. Okay, it says in uh, circumcised on the eighth day. Are you guys still there or am I muted or something? We're here. Okay. okay. Circumcised on the eighth day as the law required. Uh, loss. Uh, his knowledge of Christ led Paul to reassess the ways of truly pleasing and serving God. His reevaluation indicates the profound and lasting effect of his experience of the meaning of Christ on the way to Damascus some 20 years before. Um, that's uh, I think that's uh, not really what we've been talking about, but I do think it's good to always remind everybody that uh, the time frame that we see in the uh, book of Acts and, and in the epistles, uh, there's a great amount of time that, uh, that is being uh, recorded here. But I remember when I first read, for a long time when I read uh, the book of Acts, I thought that right after Pentecost, it was only a matter of days or weeks before Stephen was stoned. And I, I just, I, that's what I thought as I read it. I, there was no indication that there was a, any a gap in time. But uh, the, from, from my research, when I look at all the timelines, most of the experts for some reason conclude that that was about three and a half years after uh, Pentecost. And uh, uh, Paul's conversion was six years after Pentecost. Uh, the, Cornelius, the first Gentile, was 10 years after Pentecost. Uh, the uh, Jerusalem Council, where Paul and Barnabas had to go and have the meeting in Jerusalem, that was 20 years after Pentecost. They're still dealing with these same problems, having to go and try to resolve these issues. So it, it's easy to not realize that uh, these, these problems, uh, these arguments in the beginning of church history, uh, they persisted for a long time until we finally have uh, really the... the the, the, what was necessary. You got to keep Judaism out of it. Christianity and Judaism, you cannot be mixed together. And that uh, that's really what it boils down to. Um, okay, uh, seven, verse seven. Uh, uh, I guess that just verse seven, yeah, seven could stand alone. Uh, Renee, would you want to read seven for, for Ben? But you have something you want to add? Seven and eight need to be read together because the, it's not a complete thought, really, if you look at it. it, it if if you use it, as a, it's not, it cannot, because then... Okay, we'll read it together, but then there's a comma after uh, after eight. And it and, has seven, and a eight. colon after nine, and a semicolon after 10, <laughs> and a period after 11. So yeah. in other words, their, their, their punctuation indicates that this is all a flowing thought. It, it uh, is, but I, I think seven and eight, you can stop at eight and then continue with nine, but seven okay. and eight have to be, otherwise the message is mix, mixed up. I'll explain what okay. I mean. All right, well, uh, are you you supposed to read now? Is it Ben's turn to go first? I don't know. Yeah, I think you read seven and eight for Ben then. 
please. Great. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Yes, yeah, so the things that he once uh, considered uh, great treasures, the, his understanding of the law, his uh, achievements in the law, now he considers them weak and beggarly things, as uh, Galatians says, for example. He says, why you go, you know, he, Paul and Galatians was saying that, to the people who were duped by the uh, Judaizers, that why do you now go back to these weak and beggarly things after having started in the spirit? And the weak and beggarly things he's referring to are things that pertain to the law. Um, I think also, too, you know, is that well, in some of the parables, uh, and Jesus said, uh, you know, even what he has will be taken from him. And I think that's it is basically is a, a picture of the Jew who thinks he has all this treasure in the law, uh, his understanding of the law, his special status with God because he's a Jew and was given the law, uh, and the fact and all his achievements in the law. It will be found on Judgment Day that all those things that he thought were uh, to his account were actually against him. All the things that he he uh, kind of put on as his armor. Uh, he will find that they they're not they're not they won't uh, they won't uh, stand in you know with the sword of the spirit is going to pierce right through it. Um, so I think that's basically what Paul's saying here. All these things he knows were just types and shadows. They're things that are passing away, and instead he'd rather uh, find himself in Christ. Um, that, that I may win Christ. So let me see see that in the new in the New King James. Um, Oh, that I may gain Christ, it says in the new... Yeah, so, again, rather than putting on the shield or the armor of the law, he's, he realized, which is a picture of the flesh, essentially, he knows that he, he considers that garbage, rubbish, uh, something worthy of the trash in comparison to the excellency that's that's Christ, the right, the righteousness, um, the shield of Christ, the, uh, the white robe of Christ, to be found in Christ, because... Again, we're all originally found in Adam. We were all born in Adam. when We were all in the loins of Adam, essentially, when he sinned. And so when Adam sinned, all man sinned. God imputed Adam's sin to all of us. So we're, we're righteous by basically threefold under the curse of sin. We're under sin because of Adam. We're under sin because of our personal acts um, of sin. Uh, and then there's a third one I can't remember now. But, uh, but again, we... We need to be found in Christ so that, again, uh, Adam's unrighteous work made us all sinners. Oh, sinners by nature, because uh, we're, bo again, born in Adam. Um, so we need to be found, again, in Christ, born again in him by his obedience, not Adam's disobedience. We want to be found in Christ because uh, obedience to the law profits nothing. It all pertains to the flesh, and the flesh per accounts for nothing. It, it's garbage. It's rubbish. And so that's why he is... Uh, um, happy to give all the things that these false teachers, Judaizers, are, are taking their uh, pleasure in or, or their their stand in. Uh, he's considering it, again, garbage and rubbish. He wants to be found in Christ. He knows it's, the Spirit is what um, is the only way to grow. That's the only way to gain. Um, so I guess that's all I'll say for now on that one. Okay. All right. Renee, what do you say about, is it seven and eight? Yeah, I agree with everything Ben says. Uh, I wanted to be clear. Uh, Paul is not calling the law itself dung. That's not what he's, he wouldn't call God's commandments that. It's what he gained through his knowledge and uh, his, uh, of being a Jew. That all of those things, he, he realizes they were all shadows of Christ. And what things did benefit him, what what benefit it did for him when in his relationship spiritually with God, it's nothing compared to what we have in Christ. So he's not calling the commandments of God dumb. And uh, he's because I've heard people say that and there were some questions about it in the chat. So. It, listen to the wording here. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Suffered the loss of all things. That's what he counts dung. Everything he lost, he counts as dung. It, it doesn't matter to him. Now, we don't know exact uh, other things he's lost. He's lost his standing as a Pharisee leader in the temple system in the Jewish community. He lost that. He probably lost a home and a, a business when he was making the tents. You know, he, he lost all of that stuff to serve the Lord and travel far to preach the gospel. And so what what he counts dung is the things that he lost and or had as gain prior to learning about Jesus. So I, I wanted to clarify that so that we're not disrespectful, you know, thinking Paul is being disrespectful to God's law. Good point. I think, yeah, what you said is... um. He's basically saying his former position and prestige in the law, he considers that dumb. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the I looked at the Amplified, and it amplifies it quite a bit, so uh, I'm eager to read it. But uh, I want you to think about this question for the two of you. Uh, uh, when I read the KJV, the end of verse 8, it says um, that I may win Christ. Now, winning uh, is uh, certainly not the choice of words I would use uh, to talk about getting salvation. Um, and, and when I look at it in the other translations, uh, in the NABRE, it says that I may gain Christ, and when I look at it in the Young's literal, it says also uh, that uh, that Christ I may gain and be found in Him. Uh, so, uh, but when it says in the KJV uh, that I may win Christ, I like to get your uh, re reaction to that. But let me read the Amplified and I, let me talk about that before. Um, it says. Uh, I forgot what verses were on. Uh, it was uh, seven. Was it seven and eight? Yeah, seven and eight. Um, but whatever former things were gains to me, as I thought then, these things, once regarded as advancements in merit, I have come to consider as loss, absolutely worthless, for the sake of Christ, and the purpose which he has given my life. But more than that, I count everything as loss compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him, a joy unequaled. For his sake, I have lost everything, and I consider it all garbage so that I may gain Christ." So these other three translations all phrase it uh, gaining Christ rather than winning. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? You just said something profound, and I don't know if you noticed it. I typed it in the chat. I said, that was great, Brother Luke. But you didn't continue. When you were talking and you said you wanted to hear what we thought about winning Christ or gaining Christ, that what I focused on was the word that I may. So... Uh, I think this is an important thing here. If you want to gain Christ, you've got to leave the law and all you trusted in behind in order to gain Christ. If you are hanging on to part of that, you're not gaining Jesus. If you've got trust in something else, you cannot be trusting Christ. You've got to leave these things that you trusted in prior to to hearing the gospel message and hang on to Jesus only. So the words that I may, whether it's win or gain, are very profound there, I think. Also, too, is that I think that 
again, I, I harp on this a lot because I think a lot of people don't do this. I don't think there's any mystery what he means by gain and loss. Again, the immediate context tells you, and I mentioned before that I think the Bible is always re intentionally redundant so that if we don't understand what, what he means by that word, that, that word will be used, a, a synonym will be used in that same context. And throughout all, all throughout this epistle, especially in this particular verses, we're seeing a, a play on a theme, gaining and losing, losing and gaining. So what he what was what gained to him under the law, he now considers it loss. And and what he was now willing to lose under the law, he considers Christ gain. So it's about and also to it, this is about false teachers and being selfless versus selfless. Selfishness is like personal gain. So you know, gaining, uh, acquiring uh, for yourself, uh, disciples, worldly goods, uh, achievements under the law. Whereas selflessness is could could be considered a loss in some respects because you're losing all those things, you're you're forsaking all those things, and you're you're, you're gaining Christ. You're you're, uh, you're you're forsaking all those things for Christ. So again, interpretatively, I think it's important to keep the context in view here, and uh, I think he's gonna you're gonna see that theme expanded, gaining and losing, losing and gaining. Um, because again, the law, that's what the law think, that people under the law think they're doing all these achievements over their lifetimes, like they're in the military, all these badges of honor almost, festooned, and then that's what they're putting all their confidence in uh, with all their jewels or ornamentation uh, on their body, thinking that's what's going to be, make them righteous before God, and they're going to be found naked. And th that's why we need to be clothed uh, with his righteousness. Well, Ben, I, I mean, I heard you use the word gain uh, probably eight or ten times, and uh, I, I'm not. I, I'm saying that in the, the other translations, it, the word gain is used, but in the KJV, the word win is used. You didn't respond to my concern about the word win rather than gain. Do you, don't you see that win, uh, the that word, can be construed by the lordships twisted in a way that we uh, we would object to? I absolutely do. That's why part of the reason I'm not a KGV onlyist. I don't. I think uh, you, you can. You got to. That, that's what the translators chose that word, and I think you. I agree with you. It's probably not the best word for that, um, and that's why I like to. I think, and I, I think again, God protects against that that uh, those translation bias, um, because and by 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 putting the same thoughts in there twice, so that if someone if it tries to get if it's colored by someone's theology. Which I see every translation, by the way, I, I see colored by men's theology, uh, that we could get back to the original meaning by looking, just look comparing the scripture within the scripture. Um, so I, I yes, I agree with you. Win is troublesome, uh, but I think if you take it in context, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a verse that's in a vacuum. So it's easy, even if we were to hold to the fact that it. It, it, it was win. Say, for example, it translates the word in the Greek win. The context still it, it tells us that it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's a reward. <laughs> it, it, it's a gift. Um, again, I think the context informs us of that. Yeah, that's another problem. The Lord shifters pull verses out of context, so <laughs> they won't, they'll ignore the context, unfortunately. But, um, okay, uh, I guess we're ready to move on, unless, Renee, you have more to say about it seven uh eight all right then uh let me see uh i think ben you read the, the next one for renee uh i guess read read nine if you think you have to continue go ahead ben but uh, let's see how it sounds by itself okay and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the right righteousness which is of God by faith. I think I, I, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I, I keep using this verse, hoping that it'll ding, 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 a lot will go off. But somebody was just saying in the chat, they're saying once saved, always saved, so, and you got to live a certain way. It's like they're blind to this, not having my own righteousness. And it says, which is of the law. But your righteousness at all, not by works of righteousness, Nothing you are doing. It's not about how good you are. And and the way people get around this is to say, well, that's that just means you get saved. It's kind of the Pelagianism thing you told me that was the name of it, Luke, where grace is actually God's gift to make you 
righteous in your living in order to be saved. That's what they basically believe, that old heresy. So, uh, though, that's God's righteousness. So they're, uh, they're calculating their own, you know, trying to be good by the law, they think, because they quit drinking or whatever. They keep the law now. That that, that is God's righteousness. God's righteousness is a gift of righteousness. It's literally, you didn't see Jesus wearing our sin on the cross, but our sin was imputed on Jesus. And so God's righteousness is imputed on us by faith. It says here, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, and be found in him, in him, by faith, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God, by faith. Okay, I'm so sick of people taking this and go, where are you see faith alone? They insist you say it in those terms. Like it, there's many concepts in scripture and you can't just say, I need to see it in these words. It's not like that. It's an entire doctrine that's all through the scriptures. And it's, by the way, that's just a straw man argument anyway, because you just turn it around on them and say the opposite most of the time. The, the Muslims do that, you know. Where does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? Where does he say, I am not God, do not worship me? We can have this game all day. Let's see if we can find the doctrine in the scriptures repeated. And it really, really is. So this is one of the greatest verses be found in him then it's a double whammy by faith, by faith, by faith, over and over again, in Christ, by faith. That's God's righteousness. It's not anything you're doing because they like to twist this. Do you guys know what I'm saying when I say that? That it's God's righteousness that somehow God gives you the power and then you have a transformed life. And that's God's righteousness. No, it's not something you can see. They want to walk by sight. This is something invisible. And it's when you're found in him by faith in what he did, not in what you do. Yes, and they also make much of uh, the KJV translation saying, through the faith of Christ. So it's like they're saying, oh, well, uh, not uh, you, it, it's Christ's faith that saves you. Well, in that sense, it is true. God, Christ is faithful to save you if you believe in him. But they, they also teach that, oh, uh, through faith of Christ that, you know, he gives you that faith. Uh, that saving faith and it because he gives it to you it'll never waver it'll never uh fail uh but again that's just a translation uh 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 idiosyncrasy with the with the new king or the king james I every mean, other other translations say faith in christ it's just a way uh again i think that's probably the reason i'm not kjv only i like kjv but i'm not a kjv only list yeah well um you could even put faithfulness. You do that, don't you, Luke? You say it could be the faithfulness of Christ. But I, I think it just means faith of Christ. It just means uh, it, it's by faith in, in him, you know. Right. The body of the well, body of, of truth that's in the body of truth about Christ. You, you believe yeah. the record of God's that God gave of his son, essentially. I do too. Well, I will tell you that uh, when it says faith of Christ in the KJV, no other translations that I found interpret it faith of christ they all say they interpret the same verse as faith in christ the, the way that we think it should be uh, but uh, uh i i believe that if we are going to talk about christ's faith I, we, we should think of it as christ's faithfulness because christ uh if, if we believe christ is god and and, and uh, unless you're one of these uh, people that doesn't believe in the omniscience of god uh, that's a, a new heresy, I think, that uh, I've learned about it, what's called open theism. Uh, the church has always, throughout all of church history, um, embraced and, and uh, declared that, that God has certain attributes. He's omnipresent, omniscient, and omni omnipotent. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to depart from those very easily. Uh, so I, I'm going to continue to believe God's omniscient. And that means that Christ right. doesn't need faith. Faith right. means you, you, you walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, we don't know, but we're going to trust it because we have faith. But, 
Jesus didn't have to have faith because he's God. He knows. So I think it has to be understood as the faithfulness, that Christ was faithful to do what he came to do in spite of the fact that he was sweating blood knowing what he was going to go through. He was still faithful to go through it. Brother Luke, I think of it this way. When we say the faith, yeah, it's just the faith of Christ is the oh, faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The faith of Christ would be Christianity. Yeah, Christianity. The faith yeah. of Christ. The yeah, faith. That's, that's another uh, valid way of, of understanding. I think. Yeah, I think. But, that's uh, what let me let me let me say something about your Pelagianism uh, comment. Uh, one of the earliest church heresies. If you go to my playlist on uh, early church heresies. I think it'll be helpful to everybody, but one of the earliest was uh, Pelagius and uh, his system was called Pelagianism. And, and um, the Roman uh, uh, Catholic religion, uh, the, the largest cult in the world, uh, their, their official position is Pelagian. And, and that is that they believe that the grace of God is not that God is is uh, so generous and kind that he's going to give us uh, salvation even though we don't haven't earned it or deserve it. They say the, the grace should be understood as God is going to give us the ability to stop sinning. And it's up to us to use his grace to get sin out of our life. And therefore we can establish our own righteousness because God's empowering us to do it through his grace. Yeah, but call it God's righteousness. <laughs> but they call yeah. it Righteous. Yeah. Uh, let me read. Uh, let me see. What verses are we on? Uh, eight and nine? Or what the one did we just read? And just eight. eight. So let me read. Let me read in the Amplified and see how it says, what it says. Uh, um, Actually, eight and eight and nine, I guess. No, uh, I'm sorry. We read nine. We're on nine. Nine. Okay. Nine is um, and may be found in him. Uh, that is believing and relying on him, not having any righteousness of mine own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals, but possessing that genuine righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I mean, I think they stated that beautifully. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, for, for those people who don't like other translations and particularly don't like the Amplified, uh, I, I don't think anybody would be objecting to that, to that verse. Uh, okay, so that was nine. So let's go on to 10. Oh, uh, it's getting close to closing time. Uh, we started about 10 minutes late. Let me see about 10. Uh, let's read 10 and 11 and, and finish our comments on that, okay? And whose turn is it to read to the other? Forgot. It's mine, I suppose. Um, okay, so you, you read ten and eleven. And let Renee Renee comment on it, please. Okay, give me one second here because I have to flip the page. Okay, verse ten says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. And let me find the page switcher. conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. This is a good one to untwist. Yeah, I, I, Paul is not saying here he doesn't not have it yet. He's saying he wants to save others. So, uh, let me see here. I need to do a new video on this because I didn't make it as clear as I would have liked to. He says, uh, you know, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable into his death. Now, this part is about his personal walk as an apostle, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, etc. And if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, but it's not uh, all right, there's two ways to look at this, but we have to look at it as a whole. He could be referring to himself saying, I consider it like I don't already have it, but it's, it, I don't think that's the case. I think he's talking about uh, attaining others to the resurrection, bringing others to the truth of his gospel 
that's why he suffers uh, these things. And um, uh, that he may know him, the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He died to his own personal needs. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I, I do not believe he is talking about his own resurrection here. He's talking about if I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He is not unsure about his salvation. Okay, right. Ben, what do you say? Well, I have a different uh, view of that. I think, again, what he's, because what he's, he's talked, what he had talked about being selfless and being Christ like. And then later on in this chapter, he talks about follow my example. Again, this is a contemporaneous evaluation. And what he says in the next verse about being perfected, which the Bible, when it says perfected, it means being mature. So yep. when he says, if by any means I may attain a resurrection from the dead, I believe what he's saying is, I'm not, I, I am laying all the things of the law uh, aside, all the things that, you know, the law made you selfish. It, it, uh, it, it, because, again, you're always concerned about your own performance and you couldn't help anyone else because geez you might get roped up in their sin or uh you know that whatever reason uh but the, the grace makes you selfless and the resurrection of the dead i believe he's, what he's saying here is that i'm i'm trying to and this is consistent with paul's other teaching is that hey because you've already attained it because you already have a position in christ because you already have eternal life because you put off the old man now live it out and so I think he was saying with resurrection from the dead, he wants to live the resurrection like life. He wants to live as Christ did, you know, no longer uh, seeking after sin and being self-serving, but to be selfless, to live the divine nature. Um, and he's saying, I'm not already attained. In other words, I'm, I'm not already perfected. Um, but he says that press on, etc. And so, again, he's not, I don't think he's questioning whatsoever it, it, or even is, is even doubting his own salvation. He's talking about, again, he's talking about uh, he wants to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I, I know before, again, when I read, people a lot of times say, when they think of fellowship, they think of like, you know, uh, almost like friendship or whatever. But the Bible, it's, it's different. It, the Bible, it really speak, speaks of experiential or intimate knowledge of. And so... He wants to learn. He wants to suffer like Christ did. To learn, like he wants to suffer in Christ's suffering, so he can learn of Christ, and again be conformed to His death, be totally subjected to God's will, and you know not following after His own fleshly desires, like these false teachers uh, were teaching about. You know the law keeping. Um, so again, he's not questioning at all about uh, the, the resurrection from the dead. Is, again, is the power of His resurrection, knowing Him intimately by living you know walking in the footsteps of christ essentially living the christian life i think that's, that's all he's exactly, saying here that's exactly what my video was i did a video on this about six months ago and i agree with you ben that's exactly how i'd interpreted it the entire thing one i didn't want to go too far ahead about the perfect perfect thing and that's what's hard about going line by line if we go too far ahead yeah but other thing is i look at this also when we're done here you guys i want to go back through this one little section because it's clear he hadn't already attained perfection and i do believe he's talking about the power of his resurrection that's what i focused on in the video was walking in the power of the resurrection being dead to self walking in his own if by any means i might attain unto the resurrection of the dead though I want you guys to go back through 10, 11, and 12 and see if you don't get back and forth the possibility. It's just an idea of where he is, because um, he does talk about the high price, the calling of God, which is being an apostle, bringing people the gospel, but uh, also that it, it's also his duty to bring others to the resurrection of the dead. I just want to look at the wording when you guys are done, when we go through this little section. Good points. Okay. All right. Let me uh, read uh, 10 and 11 in the Amplified. It uh, says, um, and this, so that I may know him experientially becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely and 
in that same way experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed, that is, inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did. Uh, did, did, did we read 11 too or not? Yeah, and 11, I forgot. Uh, let me go back to it. So that I may attain the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, the points you made were expounded here in the Amplified. Again, uh, you know how I am. Uh, you may not like it, but I, when I see words that stand out to me and I see them as problem words, I have to I have to bring it up. Uh, and and here, here we have another one when it says uh, that uh, uh, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So here, you're going to have the Lordship heretic take this verse and see, it's not for sure you might attain it, you might not attain it, based upon how much suffering, how much fellowship, how much, how well you do all these things, you might, you might not. But when we look at the translation, uh, the Amplified, it takes that verse and it says, um, um, to his death, so that I may attain to the resurrection. And in the NABRE, it says, if so, if somehow I may attain, and, and uh, the Young's literal, if anyhow I may attain to the rising again of the dead. So they all uh, use the word may, and may is, to me, uh, I would say that in this case, the word may should be understood as that, that uh, this is, uh, it's, that's what makes it possible. That's, you, you may do it because of the, these things, and it, uh, it's going to happen. It, it, but uh, with might, I think that the Lord Shippers would use that again and, and try to sh make people doubt and not have the blessed assurance. That's exactly what they use this for, guys. This is why I'm going over the, listen to this idea, okay. There's a lot going on here about what he wants to obtain and obtain. And I agree with Ben that the majority of this is referring to him not reaching perfection yet. And he doesn't consider himself perfect yet, but in his glorified body, he will be right? Not as though I had already attained it. That's what he hasn't attained yet. But people are applying this to say he hadn't attained salvation or the possibility of the resurrection of the dead. But I just thought about this. He's not saying that. He hasn't died yet. He hasn't died. So he has not actually uh, attained a literal resurrection. Not as though I had already attained, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He, he speaks about his death a lot in this in this letter. I think if you're I, right. You see what I'm saying there? I, th I think and you're I, right, because because check this out, because in verse 12 it says, not that I have already attained or am or already, already perfected. Perfect. Yes, he's not in his glorified body. Bam, there's the key. Right. You so said or it, yeah. The or there really, really uh, I think. That validates your point. I got to clarify it. I got to go back and redo it. That was the key. That's the, I, I knew it was there. And I needed a good way to word it. But I I, I think, uh, Ben, you're right. This is about his uh, maturity. However, he's looking forward to a literal perfection of his body. His, a literal glorification. A literal resurrection. That's what he's referring to here. That's what he hadn't attained. He hasn't died yet. It's that literal. Yeah. That's what he's looking forward to. He's looking forward to being glorified. Mm -hmm. And it's not in question. Like he might and he might not. No, that's right. That's the point. He's not putting this in question at all. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I want to um, point out something else that uh, um, I, I remember recently I brought up Polycarp. I don't remember what program we were on, but uh, 
Polycarp was a disciple of John and Polycarp was, turns out he was really quite eager to be martyred. And uh, he eventually got his, his desire, his greatest desire was uh, to be burned, uh, burned at the stake. And, and they even, before, the, the, before he was sentenced to that, they even said to him, hey, Paul, Polycarp, you're an old man. There's no need for this. Just, just, just recant and, and, and just go home. You know, they, they didn't want to kill him, but if he wouldn't recant, they, they, they had to. It was the law. So, uh, but uh, he said, basically, uh, look, uh, uh, from for like 86 years or something, uh, I've, uh, um, he, he's, Christ has never done any anything against against me, and, and I'm not going to do anything against him now. Uh, so, but he he went. He, there's a record of him saying that he was going into the city intentionally so that he could be martyred because he wanted that martyr's crown. And um, I mean, I some people maybe uh, he's not the only one. Maybe maybe others. Uh, were purposely uh, put themselves in a position to be martyred because that they wanted that crown. Uh, but in this case, it seems to me that, that Paul is is pretty determined, or at yeah. least he, he he recognized that it's already settled. He's going to be martyred. It's inevitable. This is a perfect example of us reading into the scriptures isn't there. He, he didn't say, not as though I have not attained the promise of a resurrection. He said, I hadn't attained it, nor am I perfect yet. We will be perfect when we leave the sinful body. Yeah, like like you said, I think what, you're, what really drives home your point is this, not as though I had already attained, either we're already perfect. So it's not like he's saying, in other words, I'm not saying already being perfect or fully mature is the same as already being attained. But like you said, being attained is actually the resurrection. And yes. and then he says qual doesn't qualify, but he says or even even though I'm, I haven't obtained the resurrection, even in this flesh, I'm not yet uh, mature. Um, so I think that's a great distinction. I'm redoing um, that. Okay. Right. okay. All right. I guess uh, is it is it time to uh, finish up here? Let me see. Uh, we finished on uh, verse eleven, so we'll begin next time with verse twelve, Ben. Actually, we, of, we, we did 12. I love it when stuff like that happens. Like, I want to do... Well, yeah, you, uh, you actually you jumped ahead and talked about it. Oh, I'm 12. sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, we, yeah. We didn't actually read it and, and, and do it formally the way that we've been doing it, but you, you did touch on it. Well, yeah, we'll do 12 next week. We'll start with yeah. that. Uh, okay, so let's take some time now to uh, uh, give our, our summaries and... Uh, Renee, uh, in addition to your summary, is there anything going on tomorrow night for you, for your Thursday throwdown? No, so there's workers here, and it's just it's just a mess. I I'm not going to schedule anything till I know what's going on, and I have some deliveries and stuff. So no, I don't have a program tomorrow night. But um, mm -hmm. I do have one on the 26th of February. Gary Gary Wayne, the author of the Genesis Six conspiracy, will be back to talk about, uh, that's going to be a Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, to talk about the elite bloodlines and the divine right of kings and uh, those that uh, claim they're from the gods and their divine right to rule comes from the gods. The so Genesis 6, you know, fallen angels uh, uh, conspiracy and how that comes into secret societies and today and that kind of thing. It'll be interesting. Okay, well, we, we uh, studied 11 verses tonight, Renee. What's your yeah, closing yeah. remarks? I, there, I have been in a lull for the last eight months to a year, spiritually, as far as revelation of scripture. Like some things I just couldn't break through on. But I have hit a roll, man. I, I had a breakthrough earlier with some eschatological issues. And this section of scripture... I always knew what it meant. If you go back and look at the video I did, he's talking about, you know, the power of his resurrection, right? And the walking and maturity, like Ben was saying. But there were, the wording of it was, the way it was worded made it hard to explain uh, because Lord Shippers really do use this to say that Paul wasn't even sure he was saved. Paul didn't even have assurance of his salvation. 
And I know that's ridiculous because he looked forward to dying. He mentioned he'd rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He had no doubt at all. So whenever we get breakthroughs, like on the wording and how we know generally all of us did what this was saying, but to have the clarity on the actual wording of it supports everything we all thought this section said, and we need to go untwist that sucker. Uh, so I'll leave the old one up, but I'll put an update as well, or maybe I'll replace it. I don't know. But this was big for me tonight to have a way to explain it to people because you know my thing. I, it's a pet peeve when people use these verses out of context. They shouldn't even be teachers to begin with because they don't even have the right gospel. Uh, but when they specifically go out to tear down and shipwreck the faith of people that are new or don't have enough of the word in them yet, you know, um, like, like Brother Luke's, I like Brother Luke's philosophy on this. Look, you, you might not be a Bible scholar. You might not know a lot about the Bible. But if, if you trusted Christ and you know that gospel and you know that he saved you, you know who you've trusted, you cannot lose it. He gave it to you. You trust in your Savior. Don't ignore a hundred clear verses on, on how to be saved in your security to get shipwrecked over one verse or two or three verses that are obscure that you don't really understand. Well, you understand the hundred that are very clear and God's not going to contradict himself. Ask God to show it to you what this means, because you know it cannot possibly mean what these people are saying. So don't let um, anybody tear you down like that. And I'm, I'm hoping the program we do, my channel and others like it, can be a, a resource for people to get some clarity on the verses. I really do, Ben, need to get through my channel and organize it. Maybe we can go through that one day. <laughs> it's be a better resource for people, you know. But I really enjoyed the study tonight. Really, really, really did. Well, uh, it's it's very uh, common that you uh, finish one of our group discussions Sunday or Wednesday, and then only an hour later you've got a video because something we talked about in the in the group talk. Uh, you, you now you're inspired to do a video on it. I always look forward to your follow up video. So. Yeah. Yep. Make sure everybody, you, you, you catch it. Uh, it'll probably be out within an hour, I guess. Yeah, yeah I'm going to be tired. If I put it off, I'll forget. Uh -huh. uh, uh, all right. So, uh, Ben, uh, give us your uh, summary and closing remarks. Well, I, I agree with your name. The greatest high is when you get a breakthrough. You, you know, you, uh, you, you, you put the work in, you, you study the word diligently, and um, and then suddenly you get these breakthroughs and it's like, wow, this is amazing. It's like toppling giants. Um, and also, too, you know, I, one thing I always say is that hip, uh, false teaching is always exposed by its hypocrisy, you know. Uh, and even and so what's funny, like the, the people, the very same people that would teach that Paul was unsure of his own salvation by saying um, that, uh, I, that, you know, he, he's concerned that he might not attain the resurrection. Those same people also teach that uh, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 6, saying, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. They also teach that that, again, is a verse teaching that uh, something that if God starts a work in you in terms of salvation uh, or works in, in you in terms of uh, uh, drawing him to you to himself, that you, uh, that, that for sure, if, if, again, if God began a work of salvation in you, in you you'll never fall away because if you fell away or fell into apostasy or fell into grievous sin, uh, then that work must not have been started by Christ because he, he will guarantee, he's conf Paul's confident that this very thing that he has begun a good work and you will complete to the day of Jesus Christ. So the same people that teach that Paul didn't understand his, his uh, he, he wasn't sure he was saved, teach that he's confident that, uh, that he has begun a good work uh, in him logically would mean that he's also should, should be confident that, um, th so in other words, they're not even consistent with their own interpretative garbage. They're, they're not even consistent with their own theology or their own interpretative, interpretative methods, their own hermeneutic. So again, I, I, I said before, we, I think we all agreed that, well, I, I think there's general agreement that verse six is actually talking about, um, 
the financial gift and the in the in the fellowship of the gospel the it's not verse six in chapter one it's not about personal salvation it's about their participation in the furtherance of the gospel and it doesn't even guarantee that they are going to persist in it it just means that that what what god started there paul was confident was going to continue in one in, in some shape or form um so uh, but anyways, yes, it was a great study tonight. And time flew by, which tells me that uh, I think we had a lot of fun, and I definitely learned a lot, and uh, really had a great, really great study tonight. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I see that Brother Hendricks uh, reminded everybody to hit that like button if you liked it. I just did, and so uh, yeah, like, subscribe, share. Uh, hit the notification bell if you want to be notified. But the CES programs, uh, uh, you can get notifications, but uh, really you should be able to memorize when the programs come on because uh, it's uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, Wednesday and Friday nights, uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you join us for all those programs. We'll see you this Friday for the Fun Fellowship Friday. Uh, the, the study tonight was great as usual. Uh, it's always edifying for me. Uh, and uh, I, I really enjoy uh, listening. I'm, I'm trying to listen more now because uh, I'm, I'm trying to not ignore the chat room, but, but not, not pay so much attention that I, I'm not listening. So I'm actually getting more out of them now. Uh, listening to Ben and, and Renee. Um, so, yeah, it's, it was a wonderful study. Look forward to next time. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.